That's great stuff. Okay, that's good. It just happened by accident. Yeah. tables are live mics, those little uh, glowing lights there, so if you keep the banging down a little bit, that'd be great, just that'll all get picked up in the audio, and we are live streaming to Ustream today, so uh, thanks for doing that. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, David Wright Tremaine uh, for hosting this morning, for providing us, providing us with uh, the lovely beverages and uh, the great room. Uh, thank you, Craig, for taking the time out of his busy schedule to speak to you all this morning, and also one of our other sponsors, uh, Microsoft Services uh, Broadcast Network. Um, Craig is the Chair of the Technology, E-Business, and Digital Media Practices here at uh, Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, he advises clients on a lot of issues surrounding digital, media, interactive, um, and free expression of privacy and intellectual property. Uh, he's worked with big brands like Adidas America, Comcast, Comedy Central, Discovery. I won't read the whole list, but it's a very impressive list. You should check out his bio on our, uh, on our program. And Craig also teaches at the UW uh, at the Masters in Digital Me Media Program. Um, and where he's been teaching since 2002. Correct. And with that, I will turn it over. Great, thank you. Um, I, pre I, I prefer Snowmageddon myself. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, so welcome. And uh, I think you know, if you have questions during the presentation, I can take them. We are going to save some time at the end. So, um, and as lawyers do, I will try not to use acronyms. But uh, <laughs> if you catch me and it doesn't make sense, or I sort of slip into um, legalisms, uh, just stop me, and we can figure out what those are. Um, Check your mic real quick. It's on. It's, it's on. just not high enough. Make sure. Then that'll work. Um, I don't need to give you the statistics. You guys know this. You're in the business. You're here. Uh, it's big. Um, but what does that actually mean? Well, what that means is um, we've had some changes, and the law, you know, is behind technology, is behind changes in society. And so there is always a lag uh, that happens. And so what happens is that in the law, people start trying to apply old uh, doctrines to new technologies and new sort of social arrangements. And what we're seeing now and what we're in the midst of is, is really having the law try and cope with some of the social changes that have happened. So you know, some of the things that, that are going on that, that impact um, how the law is approaching things um, are some of the things I'm sure you're uh, dealing with every day. But one of the things is, is that digital essentially eliminates uh, the friction in distribution. So instead of distribution uh, being an issue, so you know, it used to be in order to get a book, right? You go down to the bookstore, your limitations were on how many books they could actually get in that bookstore and display on the bookstore. Now it's about how do you figure out within the millions of books that are on Amazon how you want to find your book. And so it's really about search and curation and who do you trust to make recommendations. And really that's what social is all about. Uh, the echo chamber effect. 
Um, I'm sure all of you follow blogs. You all have sort of your regular sort of list of blogs that you um, read. How many of you go out of your way to find blogs you disagree with and read those every day? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we, we have, what has happened is that we are continuing to fragment. We don't really have these common experiences anymore. Um, frankly, the last probably common experience we all had was American Idol in season, I don't know, five or something like that. Um, and so, you, you know, we have this um, notion of we only talk to other people who are either uh, thinking about the things that we think about or who believe the things that we believe about. And so, um, for instance, in my practice, I spend a lot of times, time uneducating people before I can educate them about certain sort of legal doctrines because they've all gone out and found within their own sort of social sets what the belief is. So you have somebody who uh, is interested in, in coding, they go to Slashdot, they find out, you know, they have a certain opinion about what is fair use and what is not fair use and they believe that to be true uh, because the people that they trust, the people in their social set, believe that. So you know, we, we've ended up creating a lot of predispositions uh, about how things are or ought to be. Um, obviously, um, by virtue of what we're doing here, since we're live streaming, you don't actually have to be here in order to, to get the benefit. Obviously, social uh, can you know is usually better um, when you can add both the, the uh, virtual and the, the real, but uh, the fact is that, that we really don't have to be present physically in order to do um, people's uh, work. I often say that my practice I really love, and the best thing about my practice is that I can do it anywhere. I can be on the road and and really there are no limitations in terms of what I can do. Um, I often say the worst thing about my practice is the fact that I can do it anywhere because then there are no boundaries in terms of, of what it is and, and when and where I can do it. Um, the democratization of creativity and the democratization of, of distribution, the fact is that um, we all are content creators now. We all feel like we have something valuable to contribute, um, whether we do or we don't. Uh, and then we all now have these wonderful outlets that we can post these things to. And I think that that changes people's attitudes. When you have something that you created and you become a creator, it's a very interesting uh, change uh, in people's mindsets when you're not merely the consumer of the content, but you're also the creator of the content and how you sort of approach content and the balance of, of those equities. Collaboration, um, which is this notion that um, we see in organizations that they really struggle with collaboration because there's this presumption in social that you're going to collaborate with other people and that, that you get this benefit out of, of this collaboration. And one of the things that's happened with the social generation is that um, they don't necessarily draw the lines around an organization in the same way that we um, historically have um, when you organize it. So you have people thinking that they will reach out to people outside the organization to collaborate, to create something, to manage something, uh, and not really sort of thinking about ownership issues, breaches of confidentiality, trade secret leakage, all those kinds of things. Um, people changing their idea about the, the um, role of privacy in their lives. Uh, people are much more sensitized to this, even though we've never had really privacy, as we'll discuss later, uh, in the United States. Um, we had this notion in the United States that we had privacy because it was so hard to find us. And that, you know, we, you had to go and dig through all of these, you know, dusty things down at the, you know, local city government in order to find out how much somebody's property was worth. Now I just go to Zillow and hit a button, right? And, and that changes people's idea about privacy. I mean, at some level, um, I, I feel for Mark Zuckerberg because every time they do something, you know, they seem to step in it uh, in terms of how they manage privacy. And yet, they are much more, um, you know, sensitized to your privacy uh, and the way that you're, you're using your privacy than most offline organizations. I mean, you go in and they collect stuff at your local retail store or something like that. They are not protecting your privacy at the same level that, that Facebook is. They don't have a privacy policy. Uh, you know, your bank only started having a privacy policy 10 years ago because they were required by law. Uh, so these people who had really, you know, that we sort of think of, those are all you know, it's kind of a, a new thing, but people are sensitized to it because of social. Um, we also have, and this is one that I 
don't necessarily care for because I'm the only one in the room in a suit, but uh, this notion <laughs> that there is, um, in social in particular, but, but sort of this digital era, this idea that we don't think that anybody with a certificate, uh, you know, the, with a certification or, you know, just because you have a title that you have value. And so currency in social media is based on reputation, not on sort of um, how you sort of fit um, based on sort of your title, your education, et cetera. Which, um, you know, cuts both ways, because on the one hand, you have people who are um, the empty suits, are not getting respect merely by having respect, but on the other hand, if you go back to the echo chamber and you look at the birther, um, situ you know, the birther uh, concept and the fact that it doesn't seem like any, doesn't matter what evidence there is, there is going to be a certain subset of people who just aren't going to believe it, isn't going to be good enough evidence to show that President Obama actually was born in the United States. And it's not clear exactly, unless all those people could be t transported back how old is he? 51 years, you know, um, and, and people could sort of see him being born in uh, Hawaii, that that would be the only thing that would be good enough. Um, and then part of that is because of this idea that we don't trust institutions anymore, and a good part of that is social. So the downside of that is, or the downside of social can be, and the downside of this empty suit theory is that you can lose that sort of trust in institutions, which then brings up the last issue, which is, there are lots of non-legal remedies. I tell my clients all the time that everybody has a free non-legal remedy, and it's called a Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to sue you anymore in order to get some sort of consequence, you know, some sort of satisfaction out of a complaint that I have um, with respect to service that, that uh, I got or something like that. I mean, it, it used to be that companies would, would take the calculus and say, yeah, you know, I'm going to have X percent of my, my um, customers are going to be upset. They're going to be disappointed with what I have. I just sort of accept that in the same way that I accept, you know, a certain level of, um, of shrinkage, of shoplifting and, and loss in my organization. But because of the social media platforms, um, companies have had to sort of start changing how they think about these issues and not worry about lawsuits as much as they are worrying about brands. So one of the things that we've seen that coming out of social is that brand may be trumping liability in terms of people's assessments um, as, they, as they manage their, their companies. So what does that mean? It means we all live in a public life. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is that we all have personal brands now, and, and this is, I'm sure, something that you talk about all the time in your organizations and, and with your clients, but this idea that what's interesting is that people's um, loyalty is becoming more and more to their personal brand, not necessarily to their um, affiliation. And so we're starting to see more and more, you know, it was a free agency that started at the beginning of the internet, we're starting to see more and more people sort of become more loyal to how they're going to manage their own brand. Um, I'm always intrigued by the number of people, if you go and look at their Twitter feeds, they might be tweeting professionally, they talk about what it is that they do, but they don't talk about who it is that they work for. Now part of that may be a fear that they don't want to have their employer you know, be able to immediately um, pull them up when they run a search, um, but on the other hand it's kind of interesting that somebody says, I am a technology lawyer. It's not, I'm a lawyer at Davis Ray for May. And I think that that's a, it's sort of an interesting shift that, that happens because we're all talking about uh, personal brands. And I think, and we see this a lot, I'm going to talk about this when we get to, to copyright. One of the things is that when people embrace social to a huge degree, um, hits and reputation and, and sort of how big the platform is, how viral things have gone, ends up being the currency that people um, people use. Well, that isn't necessarily what everybody wants. When you want to repost something, just because you're going to get them a million hits does not necessarily mean that's exactly what they want. And yet, when we think about the currency as being sort of how high you are um, on the list or how many hits you have on YouTube or things like that, which I think we tend to get into in social, um, we sort of lose uh, some of all that. So 
that's just to sort of set everything up. Um, you know, I'm sure you're here not to hear my sort of uh, pontificating about the philosophical implications of social, um, <laughs> but on what are your liabilities from leveraging social. So, you know, I think the first thing you have to do is figure out what is it and why is it that you're here and why is it that, you know, what? how do you want to use social? So is, are you trying to do this sort of offensively? You want to basically leverage this platform to drive brand, to um, expand reach, to get new customers, you know, because you've got to be out there because everybody else is doing it. Or do you want to, you know, or are you more concerned about being defensive? Is this something about you know people are doing it in your organization and you want to draw a box around it? Do you want to sort of figure out how it is that you're going to manage the bad things your customers are saying about you? Um, are you concerned about, you know, um, employees being out there and wanting to make sure that you're not uh, having legal liability uh, accustomed with, to it? So, again, you know, you have to sort of, you know, the first thing when it comes to legal liability um, with social is the same thing about any other sort of association um, with getting involved in social media, and that is to strategize what it is and, and why you're there. And, and what, is, what is the culture of the company or client that you're working with. I have a client in uh, St. Louis that is a regulated uh, company that, notwithstanding the fact that their social media uh, participation isn't likely to implicate um, their um, their regulated sort of the regulated side of, the, of their business, they are petrified of social media, and they have an internal blog um, which has uh, every post gets approved and goes through a committee um, for approval. If you want to participate, again, this is just solely within the company. Uh, if you want to participate, you have to apply in order to, to be able to be then certified that you can then comment to the blog. I don't have to tell all you guys. Yeah, I'm seeing some, some really like some, some white faces uh, out there. Um, this is a Fortune, certainly a Fortune 1000 company that is out there that is, is this petrified of losing control of the messaging that's going on. That is a culture that is very different than, um, I was on a pa panel with um, the CEO from Avo, which is a sort of lawyer and doctor uh, rating uh, company, and he was out there basically saying he didn't see any reasons why you shouldn't, you know, why the CEO shouldn't be sort of tweeting without limitation and you know everybody else in the organization and, and so you know that is a completely different risk profile so you have to sort of figure out sort of what it is and, and why you're why you're here now the important thing to think about in terms of social media liabilities is in general it's not as scary as most people think it is there are some some definite sort of places that that you know you can put your foot in it and we'll, we'll cover those but it is not um, that different uh, than a lot of other platforms. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, well, we'll get, about, get into that in a second, but so there's there's your first party liability, things that you're gonna be liable for because of the things that you did. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really matter what platform you're on. If you defame somebody, you have liability. If you, you know, if you do a bad act, you have potential liability. There's nothing about a platform that immunizes you for that. Um, for many of you, you may be thinking, uh, thinking about, no, wait a second, that doesn't sound like everything I know. There's a second concept, which is secondary liability. This is where you, as a platform, have, have potential liability um, for what somebody else on your platform is doing. And uh, in the sort of social media space, uh, you aren't going to have liability for that. And we're going to go through this with, with more detail. Uh, through the presentation, but but the thing to keep in your mind is there is first party liability, which are things that you are doing for yourself or your employees are doing on behalf of what you're doing, and then there is secondary liability, which is where you know somebody else is doing something. So if you post a blog entry, and that blog entry is infringes somebody's copyright or um, defames someone or something like that. There's nothing about the fact that it's a blog or it's on the internet or it's social or anything like that that's going to immunize you from this liability. If you then have commenters come in to respond to your blog and those commenters themselves are defamatory or infringing or something like that, 
you're not going to have liability for, for, for those folks. Which is fundamentally different, by the way, than every bit of offline media. The Seattle Times has liability for letters to the editor that are defamatory, even though they never wrote them. So this is a sort of a fundamental difference. And anybody who's worked in traditional media, there is a huge difference between traditional media, offline media, and online media. And it's something that anybody who is has clients or is working in the traditional media business um, will constantly run up against because there is this sort of um, the old media mindset about the way that, particularly the way that defamation works, uh, that really makes them not necessarily um, completely embrace um, social media and digital media as, as they go forward. Um, and if you're doing anything international, I mean, most of my talk is all going to be about um, domestic, but anything that's international, you know, all bets are off. And um, for those of us in the Pacific Northwest, I would remind you that Canada is another country. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's I am now on fingers and toes the number of times I've had com companies come to me and say, okay, we're going international, we really want to sort of think about our strategy and our risks about, you know, selling e-commerce internationally and things like that. And I ask them what jurisdictions they want to go into, and they're, it's usually Europe. And I ask them, why not Canada? And they're like, well, we've been in Canada for 10 years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you not think that they have different rules? They have actually some very, some fundamentally different rules when it comes to, for instance, fair use under copyright, fundamentally different rules when it comes to privacy rights. Their privacy um, rubric is much closer to, to the European privacy rubric, which is you know, really the opposite of the United States. Okay, so first party liability. Basically this is, you know, you, you, as I said before, you have liability for what you said. And we've had lawsuits where people have um, posted reviews on Yelp where they, uh, the restaurant disagreed with the review and filed, filed a lawsuit. Um, um, the first Twitter lawsuit is uh, currently just about ready to go to trial. Um, not, for instance, if you were going to go and, and bet on who the defendant would have been on the first Twitter lawsuit, you might have put money down on Courtney Love, and you would have been right. Um, but uh, so she actually posted on her Twitter uh, feed something about I forget now what the, the cause of action was, but but basically uh, someone failed to um, to uh, uh, do something that she expected and person found it defamatory, uh, but we've had other sort of claims and, and uh, complaints filed. Uh, Kim Kardashian is defending a claim about um, denigrating a, a diet product on uh, on Twitter. So you can still defame somebody uh, in, in 140 characters. <laughs> so, so what are these areas of risk? And we will we will do a couple of these in, in depth, uh, but but I just sort of wanted to give you sort of a flavor of, of the things to be thinking about. So first of all, defamation, which we'll talk about more. This is basically where you're saying something false and damaging about somebody that's not true. Well, I guess it's false, it's not true. But, uh, <laughs> false and damaging. Um, infringement, are you posting something that's infringing? Are you linking to something that's infringing? Um, linking generally doesn't have liability, but you may have some other kinds of, of uh, uh, potential infringement issues. Um, contests. People like to um, use the social platform to run uh, contests and sweepstakes. Um, in order to um, you know, um, run a proper contest, you have to have rules. Uh, and there are 50 different states that have 50 different requirements as they relate to contests. Um, it is hard, again, in 140 characters to get void where prohibited, um, you know, no purchase necessary, everything else that's in that sort of uh, litany of disclaimers and everything that's in the rules and things like that. So how are you going to get the proper notices? Um, I've heard a couple of the, the leading contest and sweepstakes lawyers in the country speak. Um, their view is just don't um, give anything um, on, uh, don't give anything valuable through social media. Um, one of the things in a contest sweepstakes, nobody's going to sue um, over a free CD that you gave away over Twitter. They might sue over a four-year education or a trip to Hawaii. Uh, that they felt was not sort of issued properly. So, so think about one of the ways that you can sort of manage risk in contests and sweepstakes is you just don't have something that is of sufficient value that people are actually going to raise a, a, a claim about it. 
But, but the thing is, is that there are a lot of minefields with respect to contests that you run. We're going to talk about the FTC blogging rules, but false advertising is an area that um, I think that we're going to see more and more um, work with, work or more and more um, developments in. The FTC is very active in this area. Uh, they, they have already published the guide on, on endorsements and testimonials, which is, if you've heard of the FTC blogging rules, that's, that's what that is. Um, harassment, inappropriate business practices, you know, there, there's just the damage to the brand question. I mean, when you're thinking about risk, it isn't just legal risk, it's also risk and damage to the brand, it's also risk and damage to the operations. I mean, if you end up having to send a lot of, um, you know, things through legal or hire outside counsel, even if what you did was right, that can be costly and burdensome and take people's time. Um, something else that a lot of people don't think of, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, when we get to, to building social media policies, um, but there are a number of regulations that will govern a company, and some of these are um, specific to uh, to the industry that they're in, uh, but others are, if you're a public company, you have certain SEC disclosure uh, restrictions, and if somebody goes off and discloses something um, through their Facebook page, that can create um, you know, create liability. Uh, I, they, there was, uh, just yesterday, there was a Disney, um, I don't know what his position was, I think a mid-level executive who had disclosed the Disney earnings report early. Um, and he just, quote, avoided jail time, unquote, as part of the settlement. Um, so this can be very serious. Um, the other thing is litigation holds, um, quiet periods. Uh, litigation holds are, um, social media is media. This is just like email, it's just like written documents. If you get sued, you're going to have to produce all of this social media as part of that uh, litigation. So there are policies that are required which are called litigation holds which require you to then save all of the documentation. You can't go through your, your normal document destruction um, uh, process, but your document, um, uh, but, but you may not actually have thought about the social media within an organization when either you're going through production to respond to a lawsuit, when you are developing your litigation hold strategy, when you're um, developing your document retention strategy, uh, and all of these can actually have significant um, you know, litigation consequences if you don't do this right. So, you know, the companies that you work with or that you are employed by are or should have a series of policies like this, and however you design your own or however you design your own sort of social media strategy, that needs to interlock with all these other policies uh, because those are out there and, and those can create uh, problems. Yes, sir. Do you have any examples of contests that you've seen run in the social media environment that you would advise not to have been run? <laughs> um, you know, most of the things that I've seen have been things where I think people got too cute. And I don't know of any litigation that's come up with any contest that's been run. Um, I always think, um, you know, you normally don't get the benefit of disclaimers when you say, oh, here's the blah, blah, blah legal stuff, um, which people tend to get, you know, or they're like, hey, I know we have to, to list some legal stuff, so here's the link. You don't have to go click to it, though. You know, which I have seen. I've seen that. Okay. Um, you know, so normally what I see is there's a series of tweets. You know, here's the here's the contest. Here are the basic disclaimers. Here's the link to the to the contest and sweepstakes. I think that's really best practices. Um, but you know, I would say anything over about five hundred dollars, I would probably be careful about. Um, certainly on Twitter, on Facebook, you know, you've got a little bit more um, ability to manage the optics around it. So I think that you can probably have a little bit more um, freedom where you've got more real estate to, to play with. So okay. that makes a uh, lot of sense. That's yeah. very painful. So yeah. Facebook, they, they do guidelines. You're supposed to follow them. Um, well, I mean, you do that to your peril. So, so one of the things that I always tell my students is don't confuse um, 
not getting caught with being legal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I am certain that at least half the room broke the law on the way here. You sped and jaywalked, you parked illegally. Um, you know, it's, it's something that um, we do as a matter of course. And the thing is, is that companies have guidelines. These are contracts, right? We are, we are now in a digital era. Um, the most, um, we enter into contracts all, uh, every day, I and mean, you all are probably, many of you, entering into contracts as you're surfing during my uh, presentation. <laughs> um, because each time you hit a website, you've just entered into those terms of service, which is a contract. And so this is a contract with Facebook. When you run a contest through Facebook, you are agreeing to their terms of service, which is a contract, which means if you don't abide by it, Facebook has a breach of contract claim against you. Yeah. Whether they're going to enforce it or not is really up to them. But it does mean that there's a breach of contract situation, which means that Facebook can take action, and really, you're going to have very little recourse. Um, now, you look at the business realities of, of Facebook, and you know, is this a priority of Facebook? They're pro it's not probably only going to be a priority of Facebook if and when they actually um, get a complaint or something is false and misleading. Um, you know, Facebook's probably not going to enforce that contract unless and until there is a wide variation from the rules. But that's no different than um, the FTC has priorities about when they enforce things. Lots of people are going out there violating false and misleading advertising claim um, restrictions every day. It's only when somebody has been, you know, there's a, a really bad sort of fact situation, somebody just follows through and, and complains enough, um, or the FTC has a priority. They want to eliminate a certain kind of, of business process uh, or advertising concept, and so they'll go after it. So you'll see that they are very, um, you know, the FTC is very sensitive about targeted advertising right now. Uh, and so you, know, you have to be very careful in that space in a way that you don't have to be careful about, you know, banner ads or something like that. Okay. So that's sort of the categories. Um, I mean, you know, invasion of privacy and harassment. We'll talk a little bit about privacy later, but, but you know, these are not issues you're generally going to have to deal with. But, but harassment in, in the social space, that, that often is sort of the default that a lot of people who feel like they've been victimized, there's this sort of, uh, I've just been harassed, there's a harassment, that's sort of the, the sort of the, the knee-jerk response that, that is the, uh, what, what goes on. So you need to sort of at least be cognizant of, of, of that potential. So defamation, this is the same thing. If you think of libel and slander, we're all in the same category. Libel and slander are just subsets of defamation. Defamation means that you have liability for a statement of fact, not opinion, so you were arrested, not I think you're a bad guy. Um, that's defamatory, it actually causes damage to your rep reputation. Of and concerning a living, identifiable person or entity, or in some states, vegetables. Um, <laughs> <laughs> remember Oprah and the beef, beef people? That's because uh, there were um, laws about denigrating beef in Texas. Uh, and there are laws about things. <laughs> uh, you can't you can't say bad things about apples in Washington State. So <laughs> there, are, there is a veggie. Except for delicious. Yeah, there you go. Um, it has to be so, but but you can't defame a dead person. You can't defame somebody who can't be identified, um, and that's not identified by everybody. That's identified by the neighbor. So if I sit here and say. Um, you know, the person in, um, you know, the red and blue plaid shirt that was at my conference this morning, um, the fact that all of you remember the red and blue plaid shirt is enough that that defamation um, has been published. So, so you, you can't get, too, just because you don't name someone doesn't mean that you're not, quote, naming them for defamation purposes. Um, it has to be false. Truth is, a, is an absolute bar against defamation. Uh, and then, you know, there's, a, there's some different fault standards. For, for public people, it's um, actual malice or reckless disregard for the facts. Um, for private people, it's, uh, it's just a mere negligence standard. So um, if you're going to be edgy, you should be edgy and, uh, and say bad things about famous people, not uh, non famous people. <laughs> so, so that's defamation. Now, if you remember, and we'll talk about um, soon, that, that um, defamation for 
for somebody else saying that. Somebody says nasty things in the Amazon comment or in the comments to or the, the review section of a, of a book entry on Amazon.com. No liability for Amazon.com. It's only the person making the statement that's going to potentially have liability. Then we have copyright and trademark infringement. And the thing is, is, is you know, infringement uh, means effectively that you are using somebody else's copyrighted work without permission for which you don't have a defense. The most common defense is going to be fair use. Uh, so a couple of, of notes. Um, not everybody, as I mentioned before, thinks a viral hit is valuable. So you can't sort of believe that just because you created a mashup that's really funny and really cool and got a million and a half hits on YouTube, that that means that the person who owns the properties that have been matched up aren't going to be upset. Uh, and this is um, a very common conversation that I will have um, with um, folks of a certain generation. Uh, that they really sort of believe that merely by being out, like they don't understand why brands and companies aren't just going to love this really creative, funny thing that they did. Uh, and, you know, the fact is, even this just, um, I mean, if you think about a luxury, well, I, the, a good example is, um, so if you remember back to the Volkswagen ads, um, where they, you know, they'd be just driving down the street, and then suddenly they'd get si or hit on the, uh, or, you know, T-boned or broadsided, and the, the airbags would go off, and, and it showed how safe Volkswagens were. And so they had these series of ads all around the world. And, and there was an ad agency in uh, the UK that thought, we're going to just sort of as a mock-up do this funny ad to show how safe Volkswagens are that are of the same ilk. So they, they cut this spot that uh, was never supposed to air, um, but um, <laughs> because it was funny and it went viral, or I don't know if it was funny, but it was um, interesting, it went viral. And it has somebody going around, they go to the, goes to the hardware store, he goes to two or three other places, and it looks like he's just sort of loading things up in his, uh, I think it was a golf, uh, and then he pulls up in front of a club, and then he blows himself up, and the car doesn't blow up at all. The explosion is completely contained within the car. So we're watching a suicide bomber Jeez. drive from place to place to place, and then blow himself up inside the golf, and the golf, you know, is strong enough to, you know, squash an explosion. You can imagine Volkswagen <laughs> not so happy. The message, the, the message of the stat spot was saying exactly what Volkswagen wanted. We are a safe car. Uh, it was not linking, it wasn't saying that Volkswagens are a special, or is a, is a favorite of terrorists everywhere. Um, I mean, it was consistent with the brand, and yet it was an association, and, and it got huge reach, right? But it doesn't mean that the brand wanted to be associated with the ad, you know, people got fired, you know, et cetera, et cetera, as a result. So it's important to think that viral hits aren't always valuable for everybody. Um, we, we talked earlier about terms of service. You need to think about what it is that those other platforms are binding you to. And it's especially important if you're doing anything edgy. Um, acceptable use policies are often nested within terms of service, and they're very nasty. And you should be aware of sort of what those things say, because you may find out that people can turn off um, what it is that you're doing without any kind of due process or any kind of appeal process or anything like that. And just because, um, and, and I don't know why I have to continually repeat this, but just because it's on the internet or it's on a social media site doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and that is, interestingly enough, something that is not just uh, sort of the entry level folks at ad agencies, uh, but Agency French Press, which is the French version of the AP, they learned the hard way uh, when Mr. Morel, uh, who was taking photos in the Haitian earthquake, decided to post those on Twitter, and then AFP said, hey, that's great. We will then go and distribute all of these photos uh, as part of our wire service. And so Mr. Morel, who is a professional photographer who just happened to be in Haiti at the time, ended up not being able to sell his photographs because AFP thought that the Twitter terms of service would allow them to essentially resell them. There's some complicated facts to the, to the uh, Stealing's okay. <laughs> well, right, right. I mean, the facts are a little bit more nuanced than that, but let's face it, AFP lost badly. Um, 
and, and, and interestingly enough, AFP continues to take the position that they didn't do anything wrong in this case. Um, but again, you know, and, and the thing is, is that photographers and, and also, you know, the Gettys and photo or magnums of the world are the most, um, they're often the canaries in the coal mine. They are the ones who are the most aggressive. They're the ones who are the least likely to be reasonable if you want to try and settle with them. Um, so beware of photographers. Um, or, you know, <laughs> 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 yes, sir. Not that I'm a photographer. <laughs> I took three shots of me already, so I'll, I'll watch for you later. But how does that work for if you know you put a picture up? I don't know you're a photographer. I think it's cool, and I retweet it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so so the non. If, if you, yeah, I mean, it, it's really a commercial, non-commercial kind of thing. I mean, if you want to retweet something that somebody threw up on Twitter, you're probably going to be fine. Um, but it is a potential risk. I mean, when I upload something, and this was the theory of AFP, which was if I'm something's being uploaded, if you read the Twitter terms of service, they allowed you to retweet things, and, and that you were getting a license to basically do that. And what AFP did was sort of the next step, which is we're going to grab this. Not only are we going to retweet it, but we're going to resell it, and we're going to resell it on non-Twitter platforms. And actually, after this case, Twitter changed the terms of service to sort of be a little bit clearer about where that line is. So you're not doing anything yet that's a problem. But we've seen this, um, you know, Flickr, for instance, um, you know, and, and sort of clearances where you have either things that are available on Creative Commons or other places end up being difficult um, to, to manage. Uh, Flickr ended up having a problem because they grabbed a photo um, and then they used it in a before uh, image instead of in a before and after sort of advertisement. You know, so I guess the, the rule is if you're going to actually grab something from Flickr, you should probably make sure it's the after picture, not the before picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, but that was, you know, they grabbed um, without sort of permission from either the subject or the, um, or the uh, photographer. Um, and if you're doing if you're doing something editorial, you just need to get permission from the photographer. The photographer actually is the one that owns the copyright in the work. Um, if you're going to use it for advertising, you're also then going to have to clear the person who is the subject um, of the of the photograph because that person's going to have rights to publicity. Which gets me to my next um, issue, which is, you know, it's really interesting. I had a client call and say, we had an employee who shot some videos for us. Uh, demonstrating how we use a certain product. And those videos, we then uploaded to Facebook, uploaded to YouTube, et cetera, and had them, um, had them, uh, you know, had people be able to understand how to use our products. This person then left the company and went to another, um, I guess probably a competitive organization, and turned around and said, yes, I understand that this company owns the copyright in these videos because I was an employee when they shot those videos, but they never got a clearance of my rights of publicity while I was in the organization. And the fact is, I am there selling a product, which means that this is an advertisement. It's a how-to video on how to use a product, but it's an advertisement. And therefore, my rights of publicity are, um, are, are in involved in that and because there's no clearance now that I, I have withdrawn my permission and so they can't use these videos and Facebook you must take them down and so we had to go back and forth um, with Facebook and talk about whether or not we actually had um, permission and everything like that so I would advise that you get clearances from your employees as well yes sir isn't there an exception for the model releases that you're talking about people and videos for bona fide news organizations yes yeah so news any kind of editorial, non-advertising, you don't have to worry about it. It's only when you're getting into advertising, promotion, kinds of things. So it, art, you've also got a, uh, you know, you don't need a release to include somebody in your documentary film or your, um, or your movie or anything like that. People do it as a matter of course in order to avoid, you know, um, having to fight off lawsuits later. Um, but it's not technically necessary um, in, in a lot of those in a lot of those circumstances. It's only when you're doing something at doing advertising. Interestingly enough, that could be the trailer for the movie that you shot. Mm -hmm. um, the trailer is advertising, the movie is not. So you have to actually have clearances for your trailer, but not necessarily for your movie. Mm -hmm. so, How did that turn out? Uh, we um, basically uh, took the position uh, and decided that we had an implied um, license to the rights of publicity and that the 
the employee was aware of the purposes that we sure. were going to, to use this for, and um, we took that position, and so far it's, it's yeah. I mean, it's stuck, it's been long enough that it didn't go anywhere, but but it was something that they had to pay me probably $4,000, $5,000 to sort of walk through, mm -hmm. um, and it would have taken them five seconds to get that clearance, so it's now one of my practice tips that I toss out. <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't that sort of fall under the umbrella of all the work that is done within a company when you're working there? It is not. It is not, okay. No, it's not. So, so copyright, you everything that you do belongs to the company as a matter of course of your employment, but you don't... You don't assign your rights to publicity. I can't just come in and grab a photo of you and throw it in an ad just because you're an employee. You you still have the, the right to decide what and when you can endorse. Hmm. I mean, if you think about rights to publicity, it's about basically saying my reputation as an individual endorsing this product or this company or something like that. Just because I work there doesn't mean necessarily I want to publicly endorse that company, right? right? So, promo <laughs> films, oh, so promo films that your company uses <laughs> or creates and then continue after you leave, you say, I don't want to be in that? Well, I mean, that's kind of yeah. kind, that's exactly <laughs> the issue. And, and we would probably try and take the position that it's, um, we, we would try and take the position that it was not, uh, or that it was covered, um, that it was some sort of implied consent. But, okay. but yeah, I mean, there's, a, yeah there's an issue. Hmm. Yes, sir. Does that work for the same thing for government, for public sector? Um, Generally, certainly at the state level, the feds might be a little bit different. Um, I, but I, no, I would think even at the federal, I, I don't, I mean, some of it you'd have to look at what your employee handbook says um, and the other contract that you do. Um, so I can't say that definitively, but, but I would say that, that generally it would be the same at, at the, because um, I, I don't think there's an exception, for instance, in the Washington State Right of Publicity Statute that would, that would say that. And then the last thing is, to the extent that you are getting clearances, they have to be precise. Um, a lot of times people are getting, clearances just means permission, right? It just means that you're getting a license. So when I get a copyright license to include something in something that I'm doing, you need to be precise about platform. If I get you a license to uh, leverage some kind of content in a mobile platform, does everybody think that they know what that means? <laughs> Does that include the iPad? It's a portable device, but it's not within the walled garden of what we typically think of as, as mo mobile, which is the um, which is the carrier environment. Um, I don't have an answer to this, by the way. This is something that that you know some of my largest entertainment clients are struggling with right now about how do we to figure out what exactly a mobile platform looks like because. Uh, it doesn't know, and, and our definitions keep getting longer. I mean, we just worked on a, um, on, a, on a mobile definition that was probably about 17 lines long. So um, so it can be very difficult um, to figure out. Um, there are endorsement and testimonial guidelines in front of the, or at the FTC. The key here is not to get cute, um, but the thing is that I wanted to, to, to point out is, you know, the idea is that the blogger has to reveal um, any compensation that he or she received in exchange for reviews, for placement on a blog, all those kinds of things, because then it's viewed as advertising. So if I give you a gift card, if I donate my product to you to, to play with uh, in exchange for you to then review it and write, write about it, um, any of that kind of compensation needs to be disclosed. A failure to disclose will be a problem for the um, for the blogger, but it can also be a problem for the advertiser. So whichever side of the house that you're on, you need to be very conscious of that. So as a blogger, you need to disclose. As an advertiser, you need to remind the blogger to disclose and have some sort of check-in, regular check-in, regular policy that, that makes sure that, um, that those people are actually disclosing. Would this carry over to maybe folks that you see within your community to do something that you would just reveal that you you've basically engaged with a group of folks to do something specific would you just reveal that like say in Facebook it would be the same kind of idea where you've given them product to review it and they talk about it in like the Facebook environment um, yeah I mean those those would be covered under um, you know as bloggers anybody that you've essentially paid to um, and, and paid would that mean free product would con be considered being paid absolutely. okay absolutely 
Yes, sir. Doesn't the FTC kind of walk back from this, though, in terms of how liable bloggers might be? It said the onus is really on advertisers to tell bloggers they need to be transparent, but the FTC is probably not going to go after a blogger who uh, fails to disclose that they got something. Um, that has been the PR um, that has gone out from the FCC because everybody freaked out when they um, released the, the new um, guidelines. Uh, the first two enforcement actions have both been against advertisers. Um, I, I would not count on that. They certainly didn't walk back on what was actually was actually in the guides. The guides are pretty clear, and if I'm a blogger, I'm still going to have that liability. The question is just, again, about enforcement and selective enforcement. Uh, employment issues. It's interesting because, you know, um, it, it's um, five years ago we would have said there are no limitations on sort of using um, anything that you can get to legally on a social media site in, in employment. But we actually had a really interesting case uh, that just came out, um, which I actually tweeted a, a summary. Uh, that a colleague of mine wrote uh, yesterday. And, and that is that um, you can't, uh, an employee was fired for calling her supervisor a scumbag uh, on Facebook. And then the NLRB took the case and basically said that social media is the new water cooler. And that therefore <laughs> it is protected activity that, that this calling her supervisor a scumbag was commenting on working conditions. And that therefore this was um, protected activity under the um, under the NLRB. So if you are subject to the National Labor Relations um, Act uh, as a company, there are going to be limitations on what you can do. The other thing is um, on employment. Uh, one is Germany in particular is getting much more aggressive about um, whether or not you can can look at. Um, Facebook are looking at social media communities in, in any kind of hiring or firing um, decisions. Um, and something else to think about is, does using social media for hiring decisions create a, a disparate treatment issue? What I mean by that is, when you hire, if you are only hiring through social media platforms or primarily through social media platforms, you are by definition then limiting your, um, limiting your scope. Of, of who your potential hirees are, and you may be creating some sort of a, a basis for bias claim uh, later. later. Hmm. Liability for third party agents. In general, the rule is I mean, there's some cases and stuff here, but the rule is generally if it's your employee acting within the scope of employment, there's liability. If it's your employee not acting within the scope of, an, of employment, even if they are on your network, no liability. So if you have somebody who um, is using Facebook for non-professional purposes and defames somebody on Facebook, just because they're on the company network does not mean that the company is going to have liability. So, first party liability. So now we go to second party liability in a remainder of time. Uh, basically, the thing about this is that there's very little secondary liability. You're going to have the DMCA notice take down process under Section 512C, and you're going to have Section 230 or uh, uh, bar from um, Section 230 immunity uh, against sort of tort liability. Um, the thing is, it's just because you don't have liability doesn't mean you're not going to have huge PR and other headaches. And, and newspapers in particular have struggled with how to handle comments because anonymous commenting fora um, have a tendency to, to um, as someone said, or reveal the lizard in all of us. Uh, and it is, it is not a particularly um, good platform. Uh, so trying to figure out how that, that goes, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have liability. We talked about defamation law. Uh, so Section 230 is this bar against tort liability. It is a strong bar. It is one that says that no interactive co computer service, which includes websites, it includes uh, social media <coughs> platforms, etc., has liability for another speaker. That's, that's not themselves. So, um, and we've had a series of cases that essentially have gone through and said, we don't care whether you're paying them. Um, so there's a case between AOL and Matt Drudge, which basically says, notwithstanding the fact that Matt Drudge is a paid uh, columnist for us, the fact that he's not an employee 
means he's a third party and there's no secondary liability. We, um, you can suggest um, different responses that somebody might have. You can have you know, little sort of check boxes like Mash.com does. That doesn't pull you, that doesn't make you the speaker. You have to actually be the speaker so, uh, before we're gonna impose liability. Now, if you're gonna induce illegal behavior, um, that's a problem. Um, but you know, in general, this is a very, very broad bar, and it's not likely to go away because eBay's built on this business, the whole social uh, industry is built on, I mean, it's built on this business, built on this uh, limitation of liability. The whole social uh, network concept is built on these limitations of liability. So this is a strong bar that will not go away, and which you can pretty much count on the fact that you're not gonna have legal liability, except at the real margins, for the, um, for the chat rooms and fora that, that you're managing. One thing I, want to, I, I would want to point out, though, is um, be careful about making promises. So there's no liability for doing things, but if you then turn around and promise that you're going to do something and then don't follow through on the promise, you can actually um, break down that, that bar against liability. And this is a problem that you have counterintuitively. It's one of the biggest problems with social in an organization is your best employees, not your worst employees. Your worst employees are often going off the reservation. <laughs> they're not acting within the scope of employment. You can, can avoid liability for what they're doing. Your best employees are trying to make the client happy, make the customer happy. They are making promises which may not necessarily be in your best interest, which you then don't fulfill, and which you might not have otherwise had liability for, but which now you have liability for. Best clients. So um, then you have uh, the DMCA. So an exception from the Section 230 bar on liability is um, is for intellectual property. So you have the, the DMCA, which is the safe harbor. This is the this is how YouTube doesn't you know have liability, and basically it um, it allows you if you have a notice and takedown process and you expeditiously take down notices of copyright infringement after you get them and they jump through different hoops and if you go to any major website and you look near the end of their terms of service there's a really long two or three paragraph DMCA summary this is right out of the statute that's all you need and interestingly enough most cases or all the cases so far have been pro defense so if you build a platform and you have a notice and takedown process and you go through sort of the reasonable structures, in general, you're not gonna have uh, liability for copyright infringement that is um, posted by a third party on your platform. Again, this is secondary liability. This is not your own liability. This is secondary liability. The idea here is that you um, can't have liability if uh, for things you never knew about. As soon as somebody lets you know about it, then, um, then you're, you're done. And there's no liability for linking. So if you want to put up that inline link, if you want to have that little frozen screen with the play button in the middle, um, or any other link, um, unless you're flaunting a court order or distributing child porn, you should be fine. <laughs> and hopefully, if you're here, if you're here distributing child porn, you have much bigger issues. <laughs> um, so I have two minutes? Two minutes. <laughs> uh, and the last two things I wanted to talk about, one was about privacy. There's no comprehensive privacy law in the United States. Um, and the tradition has been that the owner, or the person who collects the data is the actual owner of the data. So we, despite all of our sort of angst about Facebook, Facebook owns that data. They don't in other countries, most of the, most of the privacy changes that have been wrought on social media platforms have been because of European and Canadian laws, not because of any actions from the United States. Um, and with consent, pretty much anything is possible. So if you go and read these privacy policies, you'll probably discover that if you have agreed that your data can be handled and managed in ways that you've never really realized. So what's the problem? Um, you know, there it's just, there's all the noise and the consumer backlash and a lot of sort of people define what they're gonna do through their privacy policies. And, and both on the terms of service and privacy policies, most of the claims that we get and that we see are because, not because somebody did something bad, it's because they did something that was different than what they said they were gonna do. 
So if you say you're going to give it away to anybody under any circumstances without restriction, you can do that. And if you can make it stick from a business standpoint, then you're not going to have liability. The problem is where you said you were not going to do something, and then you went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, that's when the FTC gets involved, um, the Google Buzz um, sort of disputes that happened, the Facebook uh, stuff uh, with the Beacon, where, with the FTC, all of that stuff really sort of resulted from the failure to actually follow through and, and, and act consistent with what you said. Nothing will necessarily protect you against stupidity, though. Uh, if there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, you're not going to have any privacy. Um, and it comes as a shock to many people that there's nothing that says that I can't go leave the room, follow you to the grocery store, follow you to Starbucks, and then follow you to the dry cleaner. I just can't follow you into your place of employment. I can't follow you into your house, right? But you know, as long as I don't sort of rise to stalking, um, you know, I can pretty much find out all of these different things. So, um, but. You know, we, we're starting to see a lot more noises from government regulators on privacy. And then the last thing I'll say is just, you know, how do you think about building a social media strategy? Um, you know, I think it, you know, you need to again go back to what I was talking about at the beginning, which is thinking about why your company is involved, what it is that's the priority of the company or the client uh, that uh, you know when they're crafting the policy. Who's actually going to use it? And what you know, if, if you don't make the policy practical, everybody's going to ignore it. And so then you know you have a policy that's essentially unenforceable because you haven't actually applied it against people. So you need to have some sort of of, um, of way to that you know that's realistic. Um, and then the, the two other things I would say to think about is one is how do you draw that line between employee activity? and private activity, and particularly with small organizations, it's very hard. You know, you may only have one Twitter feed, and you're tweeting things about your professional life at the same time you're tweeting things about your personal life, and when you have one or the other, and how do you manage those things, et cetera. And that can be very difficult uh, to, uh, to, to define, and particularly when somebody is identified with the company. I mean, if Phil Knight from Nike is tweeting, we presume that everything he's doing is probably in furtherance of Nike, even when he's talking about his kids swimming, right? You know, like, like you know, you have to sort of, unless you're very clear about drawing those lines, it's going to be difficult. Second thing is, how do you have your process handle unexpected hits? You know, a lot of times people will not know what is suddenly going to go viral in social media. And so they may have something that's this really small thing that nobody really is thinking about. Um, if you think about the Grey album, Danger Mouse did a mashup of Jay-Z's uh, Black album and the Beatles' White album, and he put this together as the Grey album and distributed it to a couple of friends. People loved it, and suddenly there are half a million, a million, two million downloads that are going around. Nobody really cares about errors when they've only happened and it only goes out to 50 or 100 people. But suddenly, and, and how do you handle this situation where suddenly the VP of marketing goes, look, look at how much our brand is out here. We are now, you know, getting buzz and people are mocking us on Letterman. Um, and how is that compared with the fact that, oh, by the way, we never got clearances and we have a copyright infringement problem. And, you know, and so, so you know, if you don't have a process, if you're not thinking about what's going to happen with viral hits. So last things are how you're going to build some uh, social media policies. But I am, uh, we've talked about a lot of these. And I am over time, so. Uh, so thank you. I will stick around if people have uh, specific questions, but I know people have to go to work, so. Give me a round of applause. Yeah. token of esteem oh. from the social media practice yeah. organization. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Craig, especially Davis Wright Tremaine for hosting us this morning, <coughs> and uh, Microsoft uh, Business Media Network uh, for being a great sponsor. And thank all of you for coming out and supporting Social Media Breakfast. It's great to have you all here, especially on a day like today when you could be trapped in your cars for the next year. <laughs> 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 if, if, uh, do you have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, you want to take so a couple of questions? <coughs> Anyone would like to? Um, what's the policy on linking to a PDF? Particularly if it's found off of a website. It's, you're not going to have liability for no liability. A no. Okay. I mean, in, in, you know, you're just giving an address basically, mm -hmm. and so all the cases 
um, again, in the United States, all the cases really are about um, uh, permit, uh, permit linking. Uh, the, the one caveat to that is if you um, are linking to a leaching site, which is basically just a collection of infringing works, so if you're going to link to, like, for instance, a torrent site that all it is, you know, or you're going to build a site that all it is is a bunch of links to infringing content, um, the uh, studios and, and the uh, PROs have been getting more aggressive about that. But that's generally not something people are doing in their regular business. Yeah. Can you address uh, registering your blog with the Copyright Office? Uh, you know, um, I would not say that that is necessary. You you obtain a copyright as soon as something is original, fixed, and creative. So uh, effectively, the copyright registration is something that you're going to get, or that allows you to bring a lawsuit. Um, but beyond that, doesn't offer a huge amount of um, copyright protection because you're already getting um, pretty much uh, everything else that's that is available. And considering how much, I mean. Because you, you can only submit, for, as part of the copyright registration, something that's fixed in time. And so, you know, the thing about the internet is that so much of the content is, um, uh, you know, is ephemeral and is constantly changing. Because you're only going to get a copyright in whatever happens to be as part of the registration at that time. So you then don't have a copyright registration in any subsequent blog posts. Uh, so we tend to only recommend copyright registration for things. You have a completed film, and there are four corners of a box. Um, even newspapers don't register. They used to register their daily editions, and they would send that in and do separate co copyright registrations. But um, most of them have even stopped doing that at this point. Yeah. We have a question from the Twitter stream. Uh, <laughs> what is the liability when an organization posts photos or videos of a client from an event? Is a release required? Um, I would generally say yes. Um, it is good to get a release. Um, if it, this comes down to the purpose of the posting of the um, of the event, um, because you know, and, and this is particularly for nonprofit organizations from their benefits. This is something that. You know, on the one hand, they're trying to promote donations. It is effectively advertising with how much fun you'd have giving lots of money to us. Um, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do you manage that? And you know, in general, nobody's going to sue a nonprofit over it. They're probably just going to send, "Please take my picture down." So the risk is probably relatively low. Um, but I'm not sure, and, and especially because it's posted on a website, it's easy to take down. It isn't like putting it in a brochure. I mean, I would say from a from a practical standpoint, the rule I would do is I would definitely get a release before you put anything in um, some sort of a, a, a marketing material, secondary piece, little booklet, those kinds of things. Because if somebody does make that demand, that's going to be cost the organization money to pull that stuff back. Um, where if it's online, somebody doesn't want to be included, you just pull it down, <coughs> no harm, no foul. Nobody's really going to bring a lawsuit over that. Unless they're, unless it's embarrassing or, but you know, if it's just somebody standing in a tux on the red carpet, you know, I, I don't think that that's, um, you know, I wouldn't immediately go get the release. Um, but, you know, I have organizations that do that as part of your ticket process. You sign a release, uh, you know, it's just, you just need a little one paragraph, paragraph and a half kind of a thing. Thank you. When you're establishing, as, as a, a young company, you're establishing rules for uh, a social media platform or whatever, and you have an end user license agreement for a site, say, uh, or terms of use. Uh, I've noticed, because I actually read those things when I uh, buy stuff. Um, yeah, how weird is that? Uh, Very. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But I, I found a lot of interesting things in them, and it's given me recourse to uh, deal with companies later um, where some of them don't even know what's in there end user license agreements, which is, yeah. Um, is there sort of a, a, an off the rack EULA uh, or, or um, how does one best acquire such a, such a, so in terms of service, privacy sense. policies, you, uh, EULAs, end user license agreements, they are generally within the same parameters. A lot of times going and finding somebody who does what you do is um, you know, and then not copying it. Yeah, because those are uh, copyrighted too. It, it is, but I mean, you know, those are not things that anybody is going to um, talk about. I mean, no, it's not like anybody writes a contract from scratch. 
Right? Yeah, no kidding. Um, and, and at some level, there may not be sufficient originality, so it may not actually be copyrightable. So, um, if you change 50% of the words, it's not copyrightable. Well, <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is, is that you can only get, I mean, just because something's written doesn't mean it's copyrighted. It, it has to, to be original as well. And so if something's not original, like a fact, fact can't, you can't copyright a fact because it, there's no originality in it, so, or no creativity in it. And so, um, you know, so we might say that about Euless. But I would just find something, and I would um, then um, take that and make it um, sort of customize it to, to what it is that you're doing. Um, alternatively, most lawyers who practice in this space probably have one off the rack that they can send you, and okay. it's going to be expensive. OK, thank you. If I'm making a promotional video, can I film um, like people in a public place, or what's my liability there? You need to release it. It's in a park. They are in a public place. If they're identi if they're identifiable, uh, I mean, normally the rule is if if, if I can, you know, if they're going to be on long enough and I can identify them, then you know you should be getting a release. Um, not everybody does, but certainly if you're going to do a television ad, every one of those people is, is clear. Absolutely. Unless, you know, and, and if they're not, they're subtly obscured. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll, you know, they get releases from the people who are visible in the foreground and in the background, they just make sure that the faces are sufficiently um, obscured and posed. Yes, sir. Um, under what conditions can I modify a Creative Commons photo? Uh, it depends on which Creative Commons license you're under. You're, there are six or seven Creative Commons licenses, and so you'll have to sort of figure out which of those licenses. But the license will actually define uh, what you can do. So there are certain Creative Commons licenses that allow you to modify, and there are others that don't. And so depending on which Creative Commons license the issuer has, has um, licensed that photo to, to you will depend on whether you can modify it or not. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Of course. Go.